Well, thank you all very much for joining us here this afternoon to get the briefing on what the state is doing to slow the spread of coronavirus in Nebraska. We don't have any special guests <clears throat> today, so it'll just be Dr. Anton and I. And I've got an interview on Fox a little bit later this hour, so we're going to make this a more brief briefing. That makes sense. But again, as always, we want to start off by reminding people that we are on day 11 of 21 with regard to our Stay Home, Stay Healthy, Stay Connected campaign to remind people that we need to continue to practice of social distancing. We've got our six rules to keep Nebraska healthy. One, stay home. Don't take non-essential trips. Two, work. Work from home if you can. And if you're going into the workplace, keep socially distanced, right? At six feet distance, like Dr. Anton and I are, are practicing here. Ten person rule, wash your hands frequently, 20 seconds at a time. All those good hygiene practices we want you to do while you're at work. And then number three, shop. But shop just once a week. Go by yourself. Be efficient. Don't take the entire family to go shopping. Four, help kids socially distance by keeping them at home to play, avoiding playgrounds, and avoiding large group sports. Five, help our seniors by running errands for them or shopping for them so they can stay in, but don't go visit them in a nursing home. And six, exercise daily at home or through an appropriate socially distanced exercise. So we want to continue to emphasize that until we get through the month of April. Now, there has been a lot of talk. Obviously, last week, the president had announced his program with the different phases to start reopening up America again. And a number of folks have been talking about how will we do that here in Nebraska. And as I mentioned, what we're going to take a look at doing is lifting restrictions gradually. And so we're going to talk about today the first restriction we're going to propose to uh, release, and it has to do with elective surgeries. So we're making the announcement today that starting May 4th, so in two weeks, Hospitals will be able to do elective surgeries. Now, in order to do that, though, they've got to meet certain criteria. To be able to perform those elective surgeries, hospital must have 30% of their hospital beds open. They must have 30% of their intensive care unit beds open. And they must have 30% of their ventilators open. And they must have two weeks of the appropriate PPE available at that site. So these are the criteria that if a hospital meets that, they will be able to start doing elective surgeries. Now, I think it's also important to note that just because we say it's elective surgery doesn't mean it's an unnecessary surgery. It just means it was a surgery that was planned. In fact, these are necessary surgeries that have been delayed through our directive health measure here in the month of April. And we want to open these back up to be able to allow those folks who need to have those surgeries to be able to start scheduling those and start having those surgeries performed. It's also an important source of revenue for many hospitals. So in order to help sustain our hospitals and make sure they're available to help take care of coronavirus patients, we want them to be able to have a revenue source to be able to stay in business. So again, what we're announcing today is the first uh, relaxation of our DHMs that will be allowing hospitals to be able to start performing elective surgeries May 4th. Now, on that DHM as well, you'll note that we had also included veterinary services and dental services. The, those will also be relaxed at that point as well. So dentists will be able to start seeing patients again on May 4th. Uh, veterinarian services will be able to be performed. Uh, this, this also covers, for example, ambulatory surgical centers. So ASCs will be able to start performing surgeries as well. So again, that is our first step in being able to start lifting some of these restrictions that we've put in place with regard to DHMs. And again, only under those criteria that I just outlined with regard to 30% hospital beds, 30% ICU beds, 30% ventilators available, and two weeks of PPP available. Uh, next, as part of what we're doing with regard to our testing, we're going to be issuing a health, uh, what do we, a health action alert. No, action network. Health alert, alert, alert network. network. Health alert network. Uh, advisory. Uh, we'll be putting that out later today with regard to the testing procedures. And basically what it will mean is that we are going to allow the healthcare provider to make that call with regard to somebody getting tested. So really loosening the restrictions about somebody getting tested. Um, prior, it had been, you know, really those high priority people around 
healthcare workers and first responders, EMT police, so forth, as well as people at high risk conditions. This will basically allow healthcare providers, if somebody comes in with the symptoms and the doctor wants to make the call that that person should get tested, or if they've been exposed to somebody who has uh, had been diagnosed with coronavirus and they're symptomatic to be able to get that person in line to be able to get a test. So we're loosening some of those restrictions on testing that we hope will be able to allow for more folks to get testing. Um, if you kept track over the weekend, you'll see that the testing lab was able to get back, uh, well, total in the state, we got back uh, over 2,000 tests over the course of Saturday and Sunday. So the capacity, we got more tests in, uh, we're going to be able to loosen up that priority, those uh, restrictions so we can get more samples in and be able to continue that pipeline of tests coming back here in the state. So that is another important message we have today. Also, April 20th has somehow become some sort of marijuana smokers holiday. And it's important that people know that whether you smoke tobacco or marijuana, you know, think about this, you're burning a substance that creates little particulates that then get stuck in your lungs and creates inflammation. What this does is it complicates a healthcare provider's ability to diagnose you if you've got coronavirus, and it complicates the ability for you to get treatment if you've got coronavirus. It basically makes it harder. And so with that, I'd like to call up Dr. Anwo, uh, Dr. Antone, the state's chief medical officer, to talk a little bit about uh, what happens when you're smoking either tobacco or marijuana and why it is bad for you, especially during this coronavirus. Dr. Anto. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> we all know how serious COVID is, but it can even be more serious threat to those who smoke tobacco, marijuana, or vape. We know that people, that when they inhale these combustible products that contain chemicals, it causes inflammations in the lung airway passages and can cause severe injury. And you add on to that the viral load in the lungs, and it can be very devastating for your pulmonary condition. When you have this airway inflammation and you get COVID-19, there's very much a higher risk for complications surviving the disease. Recent studies show that smokers are more susceptible to severe symptoms. And in a recent study, the New England Journal of Medicine showed that people who smoke and get COVID-19 are two and a half times more likely to have severe symptoms compared to people who do not smoke. And it could be any type of smoking, cigarettes, marijuana, or vaping. Now smokers, by the nature of being smokers, have an increase in their lung disease and a decrease in their capacity, lung capacity. And this is what causes some people that get COVID to need a ventilator. And then if you go on a ventilator and you have this lung disease, it makes it very, very hard to come off the ventilator, decreases your chances of coming off that ventilator. In addition, smoking, whatever, cigarettes, marijuana, vaping, is a hand-to-mouth type process and sharing of smoking or vaping products or marijuana products can lead to that transmission of the virus from person to persons. Now, I did surgery for about 40 years. And I know towards the last part, 10 years especially, if a patient was a smoker and needed elective surgery, we had them discontinue smoking before surgery because of that high risk for having pulmonary or lung complications after their surgery. And we know that studies show that even just decreasing or stopping smoking two weeks before that surgery can increase your, or increase your risk for getting off a ventilator or decreasing your risk for any pulmonary complications. A lot of people ask me, oh, I smoked my whole life, you know, what's two weeks gonna matter? But studies show that it does make a difference, just quitting two weeks before you have that surgery or get that illness. So across the state, obviously, we're working together to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. And it's important for Nebraskans to be aware of the risk associated with smoking, again, cigarettes, marijuana, vaping, and contracting the COVID-19 disease. If people are ready to stop smoking, vaping, the Nebraska Quit Line can provide help and support 
The number is 800 quit now or 800 784 8669. Thank you very much, Governor. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Anton. So it's fair to say then that during this pandemic, quitting smoking right now would be a good thing, right? I mean, when I had, when I did surgery on patients and they said, why should I quit now? I've smoked my whole life. It definitely is a benefit. Just two weeks after you quit smoking, a lot of the processes that do damage to your lung are reversed. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Anton. Uh, also, the uh, payroll protection program which the Small Business Administration launched to be able to help small businesses be able to get through this pandemic. Last week, we provided an update to you that Nebraska was the number one state in the nation with regard to taking advantage of that program at 75% of our payroll being covered. Uh, that number has increased to over 80%. Nebraska is still number one. Uh, over 23,500 loans have been processed through the SBA and $3 billion have been loaned out to Nebraska companies. And again, that is a credit to our community bankers who have worked so hard with our small businesses to be able to manage the process with the SBA, staying up late at night, getting up early in the morning to get onto the website for the SBA to get those loans processed. So again, Nebraska is still number one in the, the uh, dollars or the percent of payroll that is being covered rather here in the state of Nebraska with over $3 billion. Uh, next, this week we continue, we'll, we'll continue to have the 2 p.m. briefings here, 2 p.m. Central Time. And then uh, on Thursday night, I will be on NET at 8.30 doing the town hall. So again, continued availability there. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get into our Q&A. Again, with a reminder that we've got, uh, to cut this one a little bit short today, we got a lot of questions too. So uh, Christian Wagner, NTV, Norton County, Kansas, says, it, uh, says if any of its residents visit Hall, Adams, or Buffalo counties for, some other, uh, for something other than essential or work or medical appointments. They must quarantine for 14 days upon their return. What does Governor Ricketts think of the move by a county that borders Nebraska? We actually have something similar like that in place right now. So what we've said is if you come in from out of state, you're one of those snowbirds, uh, maybe you're somebody uh, coming here to your cabin, you need to quarantine for 14 days as well. So this is just something that we're already doing here in the state of Nebraska. Jose uh, Zosaya from KETV. President Trump recently said testing is a responsibility that states must take up. It is, is that part of the reason why Nebraska is behind other states, such as Iowa, when it comes to testing capacity? And the reason that we are limited in our testing capacity has been the availability of reagents. We are working to acquire more of those reagents. We're actually feeling more confident about our supply lines to be able to do that. Uh, obviously, we're loosening up some of the restrictions that we have with regard to testing. So we should see continued ex expanded testing from our public health labs. We are also exploring other channels to be able to uh, expand our testing. And then finally, the federal government today uh, provided a list of all the different labs here in the state and the types of machines they have. And so we'll be following up with those labs and the machines there to see what available testing we may have available in the state that we haven't tapped into yet. So there's a variety of channels we're pursuing to be able to expand testing. To that end, how can we compete with other states for tests and supplies so we can increase our capacity? What are we doing right now to gathering those testing resources? I think I just answered that question and we're continuing to look for ways to expand that, so stay tuned. Have you received any updates on concerns improvements for treating patients at Grand Island, excuse me, Grand Island CHI um, St. Francis? And uh, right now at uh, Grand Island CHI Francis, uh, they have got uh, about 16 ICU beds, 14 of them are in use. 12 of them are for uh, COVID positive patients. They have um, 11 of those 12 are, are in the ICU or on ventilators. Overall, they've got about 35 patients. I think they're about 50% capacity overall in their hospital beds. They have asked for more help in Grand Island that CHI is gonna be moving people from Omaha to Grand Island. And in fact, this is where we're gonna take advantage of our lodging program because we will be able to offer those healthcare workers the opportunity to stay in a hotel while they're in Grand Island. Uh, we mentioned this, grand, this lodging program for healthcare workers and first responders and so forth, so we'll be able to take advantage of that in Grand Island. And Dr. Anton, I'm going to give you a chance to say, add anything else uh, that you have with your conversations with CHI. Yes, again, I, I talk with the CMO at St. Francis uh, in Grand Island on a daily basis, if not twice or three times basis, and uh, the numbers the governor just said is what's up to date right now. 
They don't seem overwhelmed. They are still transferring patients out if necessary. They like to keep their ICU census right around 14. So they seem very much under control at this time and, and obviously appreciate all the help the other hospitals are providing them too. So kudos to all those people in Grand Island St. Francis Hospital. I know how hard they must be working and, and now for at least the last couple of weeks, uh, really quite hard, so that's all. Right. Thank you, Dr. Antone. Yeah, so again, I just add my echo, Dr. Antone, add my thanks to all the healthcare workers in Grand Island who are working very, very hard to be able to manage the situation. Uh, the next question from Jose was, uh, which data model is the state following right now to track the projected surge slash peak in cases? Uh, we look at a variety of things. Again, one of the key things we focus on is hospital utilization. At the end of the day, all of this is about making sure we don't overwhelm the healthcare system, that we keep that capacity. So, for example, again, we just talked about CHI St. Francis. They are working very, very hard, but we have been able to provide that bed, that ICU bed, that ventilator for anybody who needs it. They're getting the care they need. That's what's key, one of the things we focus on. We do also look at, for example, the IHME model, which has been changing. They update it every so many days. I think we're down now to, they've reduced it down to a projection of 127 deaths from uh, nearly 500 deaths where they started uh, a few weeks ago. And so, uh, again, that's good news with regard to how at least that model is viewing what's going on in Nebraska. Uh, Dr. Ali Khan has just released also a new model, and I haven't had a chance to take a look at that one, but asked for that data today, as a matter of fact. Uh, Don Walton, Lincoln Journal Star. Question, Facebook says it is blocking anti-quarantine protesters from using its site to organize in-person gatherings at the urging of some state governments that currently prohibit large gatherings. Facebook listed Nebraska as one of those states. Did uh, you urge Facebook to take such action? Uh, we did not urge Facebook to block any sort of protesting organization that was going on on Facebook. The outreach we received from Facebook was specifically about uh, what are our rules with regard to in-person gatherings. We provide them the public available data that you know we're limiting public gatherings to 10 people and that has been something that has been in place since March 16th, so that's been out there for a while, but we did not tell Facebook that they should be uh, blocking any of uh, the organizations that are trying to get protests going. Uh, Cody, Cody Renfeld of WJAG, what are his thoughts on the Cronus outbreak at Tyson plant in Madison? Is he working with Tyson on it? Does he have a plan to forcing the plant to close, especially if more cases are confirmed? So yes, we have been working with Tyson. In fact, uh, I spoke with Steve Stouffer, who's the president of Fresh Meats, uh, this morning. Uh, we are, actually had a call last Friday with uh, a number of our food processors in the state that we're gonna turn into a weekly call that will be about sharing best practices and what are the things we can do to do more outreach to the communities where English is not the first language. So we wanna do a better job communicating with regard to that. And also we've got Shelly Sweetholm who is on our team, she's from UNMC, but she's on our team to, actually Nebraska Medicine, but she's on um, our team to be able to help with facilities, and so she is touring food processing facilities to be able to give them tips and pointers about how they can improve their operations with regard to social distancing and help them slow the spread of virus here in our state. So we're doing a number of things with regard to uh, working with the facilities, and the whole goal is to actually keep them open because they are vital to the food supply chain here in our country. We've got to keep those food processing plants open so that we can continue to make sure that not only our state, but the entire nation is fed. Chris Stoom from NTV, what kind of crisis communication elements have been put in place? How has that been operated inside of the different health districts in GI? There are Hispanic, Somalians, et cetera. So this is a, actually, there's a lot of stuff going on with this one in particular. So again, uh, we also had, I also had a call uh, five o'clock Friday night with Mayor Steele from Grand Island and Teresa Anderson talking about, um, you know, again, just checking with them to see how things were going and what else we could be doing to help them. Uh, part of that is going to be on communications. In fact, uh, tomorrow here at five o'clock, we're gonna do a Spanish language press conference to be able to do, again, a better job with regard to how we're communicating to those communities where English may not be the first language. Uh, We've been working with, for example, JBS, and I think I mentioned this in a previous press conference, that they're sending handbills home with people taught in Spanish, obviously English, uh, Somali, written in Arabic, to be able to communicate to those uh, communities with regard to you know, what the social distancing guidelines are and that sort of thing, and you know, again, just really trying to in, uh, educate people on the 
non-pharmaceutical interventions, those NPIs that are so important to slowing the spread of the virus down. Uh, we're also going to be doing, uh, you know, I, I mentioned I think CHI has taken out ads in Spanish to be able to help communicate. Dr. Grover in Grand Island has sent out uh, letters to their families in the school districts in Spanish. So uh, we're translating our press releases into Spanish, doing some of our social media in Spanish. So we are looking at a variety of ways to be able to do a better job of communicating. And tomorrow at 5 o'clock will be another step in us to be able to do that with regard to how we reach out to those communities. Uh, have you thought about designating someone like Scott Frost who can connect with these demographics to get the message across? As a matter of fact, Chris, maybe you can encourage your station, NTV, to play our, pro, our PSA we have with Scott Frost that we put out there because we have a PSA and you guys could play it. That would be great uh, if you're not already. Uh, what platforms are being used to get these messages across? Again, we're using a variety. Uh, we're doing Facebook Lives. We're using Twitter. Uh, we're using newspapers. We're using radio. We're using you know, these television broadcasts, PSAs. We are, there's a number of things we're doing to try and get these messages out all across the state. If there is one out there actually you think we are missing, uh, that there's some platform that we should be using that we're not, please let us know so that we can take a look at that and maybe add that to the channels that we're using to communicate out. Uh, Christina Stella, NET. It's clear the governor is in regular contact with the various meat packers about uh, their mitigation plans. Have workers been present, any of them, or only management? So the conversations we've had primarily have been with management, again, about working on best practices, though we have received feedback uh, from folks in our public health districts about what they're hearing from the workers on the front line. I've also spoken with Eric Reeder, who's the president of the UFCW, uh, Local 293. Uh, on Friday, he shared with me some of their best and worst practices they've seen in the industry. I actually will admit I haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet because he got it in late on the day on Friday. But that will be another way that we work with our food processors with regard to how they're taking steps to slow the virus here in our state. What is holding the government back from implementing regulatory directed health measures aimed at meat processing plants? What is the strategy behind leaving mitigation up to employer discretion instead of a statewide policy? Well, again, if, if you think, what's the old saying, that if you think, only have a hammer, you think everything looks like a nail. Our approach has been to work with people collaboratively. That's what we've taken the entire approach through this entire pandemic, to work with people collaboratively where we can to be able to get compliance. And if you look, for example, in Nebraska, it has slowed the spread of the virus here in our state. It has been effective. We have, when we've gone, for example, the mayor of Omaha went to the big box stores, they were willing to be accommodative. That's happened all across the state when local officials have reached out to businesses that's what we're doing here at the state as well, reaching out to those meat packers, setting up these weekly calls, sharing best practices, and really working with them collaboratively to be able to slow the spread of virus. They have an interest in that too. They want to keep their plants open. We want to keep their plants open. That's how we supply the food chain here in our country. So it's important that we're working to protect the safety and health of their teammates because if they don't do that, then their teammates are not going to show up at work. So this is a part of what we're doing is to work collaboratively to be able to get all those, uh, get that done. And again, we will continue to do that. Now, if there's something else we need, we think we need to do because we're not getting the results we think we ought to be getting, then we'll take a look at those actions as well. But again, we, keep in mind the whole goal of all this is to make sure we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. And if you look at places like Grand Island, we have been able to manage this in a way that has not overwhelmed the healthcare system. Okay. Henry Cordes, the Omaha World Herald. When there was a significant outbreak in northeast Iowa, the state's governor implemented an emergency measure to try to stop the spread. Her order decreed residents could only gather with people who lived in their same household, and it required businesses to evaluate which employees were essential and take steps to have the rest work from home. It requested police officers enforce these measures. I think I addressed this question already. Well, actually, let me go to the next one because that wasn't really a question. Uh, does, Nebraska plan the gov uh, does the Nebraska plan the governor has followed include additional steps in the event of significant outbreak? If so, what would uh, cause those provisions to be invoked? And again, it gets back to certainly we're going to use the tools we have available if we deem that necessary. We're working collaboratively with these companies to be able to make sure that we're staying open. We're working with the local public health districts, as I mentioned, the call with Teresa Anderson and, and Mayor Steele in Grand Island on Friday. Uh, we're going to continue to work with them with regard to how we address this to make sure that uh, we can do this in a way that does not overwhelm the health care system. That is our goal. Uh, also from Henny Cordes, the Omaha World Herald, even if a plan doesn't have such provisions, has the governor considered taking additional emergency measures 
Uh, now both Hall and Dawson County have emerged as the, two, uh, the nation's two biggest hotspots. So again, I just uh, refer back to, um, you know, that we actually we have seen, and Henry's exactly right, we have seen that Hall and Dawson County are the um, kind of the hotspots we have here in the state. Uh, of the testing that we came back over this weekend, I mentioned we did over 2,000 tests. We had 348 positives. 46% of those positives came from either Hall or Dawson County. So almost half of our positives in the state came from those, just those two counties. But again, I note that in neither one of those counties are we in danger right now of overwhelming the healthcare system, and that's what we're really watching, is to make sure we don't do that. Taylor, do you have additional questions? Steve White wants to know what resources does the state provide to Grand Island, and what is making a difference? So Steve White wants to know what resources is the state providing to Grand Island, and what is making a difference? We mentioned that the additional testing that we had there, I think we had additional testing by the National Guard Wednesday through um, Saturday. And so we're doing additional testing, and the testing then leads to additional contract tracing. And that's one of the areas where we need to provide um, Grand Island and the public health director there more resources to be able to do more of that, that uh, testing or that contact tracing and so forth. So we're, we're working on a plan to be able to provide that just in general in the state. That's one of the things that we need to beef up, like our testing. We need to beef up, beef up our testing. We need to beef up our contact tracing, get more people trained. Do more, and what contact tracing means is you find somebody who's got that positive test, and then you go back and see who did they talk to over the course of the last couple of weeks, and tell those people they've been exposed to somebody who has coronavirus, and ask them to quarantine to make sure they didn't get infected too. And that's a way you slow the spread of viruses by doing that outreach to all those folks and asking them to stay home and quarantine until it can be determined whether or not they actually have the virus or not. So that's one of the resources. And again, we already talked about the additional communication we're going to be doing into uh, communities where English is not the primary language so that we can, uh, again, do more education and get better compliance with our NPIs. Aaron Duffy has a couple of questions. Her first one is... Aaron Duffy from the World Herald? So the question was, are, is the state tracking absences in food processing plants, and are we tracking specific cases to food processing plants and the um, uh, nursing homes? I know that we're doing that in a, uh, not an automated way right now, and Dr. Anton, you want to talk a little bit about what kind of our thoughts on that are? So as, as far as nursing homes, yes, we have a team that keeps track of any nursing home that has a positive tested resident. And so we keep track of that automatically. As far as the processing plants go, we do have a system where we could track that. Currently, I can't give you the numbers on what that is. It's presumed that some of the numbers that we've gotten back from Hall County are most likely from the processing plant, but I can't give you specific percentages at this time. We could get those numbers to you, though. So uh, Aaron was also asking what uh, things can be done to be able to prevent uh, more outbreaks before pr food production is being impacted. Uh, I think actually she's bringing up a great point. Food production is being impacted right now with the, not just here in Nebraska, this is not a, an issue, uh, you know, a, a case unique to us. Just about every state that I know of that has food processing plants has cases where they've got outbreaks at those plants. And part of it, again, you know, this is manufacturing, if you want to think about it that way. You can't do it from home. And so you've got potentially thousands of people that are working in one facility that was not designed to do social distancing, so it's very difficult to be able to do that. And you can see this in states like Pennsylvania and Colorado and Wisconsin, you know, as well as our neighboring, well, Colorado's neighboring, but uh, also Iowa, South Dakota, and Kansas, and so forth. We're seeing this. And so the steps that we're taking that I already kind of outlined are part of what we're doing to be able to mitigate this, and we'll continue to, you know, work with those plants. Because, again, if you look at just over this past weekend, um, you know, Dawson and Hall counties, where we've got some of these food processors, accounted for nearly half of all of our tests that po turned out positive over the weekend. Jackie Harms with KNOP wants to know when will eye doctors be allowed to see patients? Jackie Harms of KNOP wants to know when will eye doctors be allowed to see patients? And the announcement we just made today with regard to elective surgeries should allow eye doctors as well. And I'll just double check that. Looking over Dr. Antone, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, should allow eye doctors to be able to start seeing patients May 4th. 
She also wants to know if the Lexington Tyson plant's involved in your reprocessing conversation. So are the Lexington, um, I'm sorry, the Lexington, what else? Tyson plant. Oh, the Lexington Tyson plant. So I spoke to Steve Stouffer, who is the president of Fresh Meats of Tyson. He has all the plants, uh, he's responsible for all the plants here in Nebraska, so yes. So Grant Schulte wants to know, with our announcement with regard to elective surgeries, will that apply in places where we still have DHMs? And the answer is this will be a new DHM that will be statewide. But again, this will be such that the hospital will specifically have to meet the criteria that we laid out. So it won't be so much a geographic designation, but rather a specific hospital designation that will have to happen for that hospital to be able to open up. So, for example, right now, if we were to look at Hall County, we talked about some of the stats for CHI St. Francis, should they still be at using 14 of their 16 ICU beds come May 4th, they would not be able to do elective surgeries because obviously that is way more than 30% of their overall ICU beds. So I'm going to go ahead and then now open it up to folks here that are here with us here in the room. Paul. Oh, sorry. So the question was, a property tax owner went to go pay the property tax bill. He tried to pay half, and the county, I don't know which county you didn't mention, Sarpy County said that uh, we, don't, we only take full payments. Um, and is there anything that we can do about that? Because now he's going to get uh, on the hook for the interest payments to go along with that. Uh, you know, that is something, we can certainly take a look at that. Uh, I, I will tell you that that is standard, the standard practice in counties, that if you are late or you're not paying in full, they typically don't accept those. So, uh, but with regard to, you know, late payments and interest, that's certainly something we could take a look at. So, so, excuse me? Right, you would think that, yeah, you would think they would want to take that, right? Because at least they'd be getting half the money as opposed to rejecting the entire thing. But, I don't, so I don't have an answer with that right off uh, the top of my head, Paul, but we can certainly take a look at that as an, an option to be able to help provide some people with some relief and help counties be able to get some money. So Paul uh, just asked, is this, the state home question keeps coming up. Uh, I got to tell you, I also get an equal number of people telling me you got to end these restrictions, you got to end them early. So I would say there's two sides of that story, Paul. It's not, it maybe comes up in some circles, but not in others. And again, we have asked people to stay home. That's what our whole campaign for the next 21 days is about. Stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. We got our rules, first one, stay home. So we are actively communicating to people they should be staying home. So you're talking about a mandated stay at home, shelter in place. And I'm, I'm going to use an example uh, that we had uh, just, we talked about earlier. You've got shelter in place states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Colorado. They still have outbreaks in their food processing facilities, just like we do here in Nebraska. So I, I, I really, again, don't know that you get necessarily a lot from those shelter in place strategies. At least it hasn't worked in the food processing industry. So. What we need is people to follow the rules. And that's what we're working on, is to get people to follow the rules. What would you say to people that want to go out in the street and pull up a sign and say, we're giving our constitutional rights to not adhere to any of these rules? So there's a, what would I say to people who want to go out in the streets and hold a sign saying my constitutional rights are being violated? I would say that you know, in emergency situations, and we're in one, public health emergency, it has always been acknowledged that the state has the ability to take extreme measures that you wouldn't take in a non-emergency situation. And that's what we have here right now, is we've got an emergency situation where we're asking people to stay at home because that's what's gonna help slow the spread of the virus here in our state and ultimately be better for everybody overall when we protect the healthcare system. So this is a, a temporary, short-term thing. Uh, the Constitution absolutely acknowledges that the state has the ability to do this in emergencies, and that's what we're doing right now. So the question was from Fred Knapp uh, at NET, what, what, what data or what information do we get with regard to um, uh, 
And why do we think we can all now start uh, releasing these res uh, restrictions on elective surgery starting May 4th? So again, we're not doing it this month, so we're going to continue the rest of this month with regard to those restrictions, as I've said before. But I did say we're going to start looking at measures to start lifting some of these restrictions, and we have lifted this one starting May 4th with those criteria. And the data we were looking at was basically hospital utilization across the state. I mean, if you look right now, even in Grand Island, we're being able to manage this where we've got a hot spot. In Omaha right now, you can look and about 75% of the ventilators are available. About half the hospital capacity is available. We only have about 35 patients with COVID. I think it's 35, right? Is it 35 patients in Omaha? In Grand Island. Oh, it's Grand Island. How many are in Omaha? Uh, Omaha. Do we have Omaha? Yeah. It, again, just relatively speaking, uh, we've got... I think it's 190, yeah. 190 hospitalizations with COVID? Only 190 total hospitalizations oh, at the current time. Omaha has, actually has less than Grand Island. Yeah, so Omaha actually has less than Grand Island. Oh, it's 21 in Omaha, right? Yeah, 21 hospitalizations with COVID. Uh, so what you're looking at right now is you look around the state and you see hospital utilization. We're not seeing that it's being overwhelmed. And so we believe we have the ability to start loosening some of these restrictions with those caveats, you know, those criteria that will allow, if we start seeing a surge in some place, to be able to back off of those to be able to make sure we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. The 21 is for ventilators in Omaha? 21 ventilators in Omaha right now being used for COVID patients. Thank you very much, Taylor. Yeah, John. Well, over the weekend, we got 2,000 tests back. Now, again, I don't expect that to necessarily be sustained because a lot depends on how many testing samples and so forth we get, but we are looking to continue to expand our testing and looking for ways to be able to do that. I mentioned uh, the federal government today gave us some, of the, uh, some ideas with regard to labs and machines that we could go explore. We're looking at other channels as well, so we're going to continue to look for ways to expand that testing. Lee. So the question was, with the record-wide lows for oil, what will that have an impact on Nebraska? I can tell you one of the areas that's going to have an impact on Nebraska is with our ethanol industry. Uh, this is an industry that, as we know, we blend ethanol into our fuel supply. It's also important for, example, our cattle feeding industry as it supplies those dried distillers, gain, dried distillers grains as part of the, or any distillers grains, as a part of the process as a byproduct that then gets fed as a high-protein food supplement to cattle, and so that's part of the golden triangle we have here between corn, ethanol, and cattle here in our state, and with one leg of that triangle, ethanol um, being harmed by these low oil prices, that has an impact on our agricultural sector, which is, of course, our state's biggest industry. So I'm very concerned about where that, those low oil, low oil prices, uh, what they're going to do to the ethanol industry that has already been struggling because some of the steps the EPA has been taking. So it is a big concern. I know it's going to be a big concern for some of our neighboring states like Oklahoma, or, you know, close states like Oklahoma and North Dakota that have uh, parts of their economy that are dependent on it. I know they pump oil in Kansas. So it is a big concern for a lot of our neighboring states, maybe more so from us directly, but certainly it's going to impact us with regard to ethanol. So the question was, should Congress approve another package for the payment, uh, Paycheck Protection Program that would put more money into that program, because that program has exhausted the money there? Would small businesses need to reapply and, and to be able to get that money, or would their application stand? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. We'll have to go research that and find out. And I think uh, some of it will just depend on how the law is written as well. If they write the law that previous applications are good, then maybe those applications will be considered first in line. Okay, so uh, the first question was about JBS uh, paying an incentive bay of $4 an hour to the workers there. And again, uh, JBS, private company, encourage them to look at ways to be able to make sure they, they stay in operations. We're helping more on the health side, but if they're going to pay in financial incentives, then, you know, that's obviously their business to be able to do that. And what was the second question? 
And then do we have an update on the number of people at the JBS plant in Grand Island specifically that have been tested positive? And Dr. Anton, do you have an update on that? Yeah. Uh, it's going down, actually. Uh, Hall County accounts are going down now rather than up like they were the last three days. So it's starting to come down as far as counts in Hall County per se. Do you have anything specific for JBS? Uh, not specific for JBS, just Hall County. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, we are we can get them for you. I don't have them right now. Great. Great. Thank you very much, folks. Appreciate it. We'll be back here again two o'clock Central Time tomorrow to give you another briefing with regard to what the state is doing to prevent the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. Thank you to every Nebraskan who's following these rules who is staying home and helping to slow the spread of coronavirus here in our state. You're helping to protect vulnerable people in our state, and you're helping make sure that our health care system can provide that care to anybody who needs that hospital bed, that ICU bed, or that ventilator. What you're doing is working. Keep at it. we got a bunch more days here left before the end of April. we got to stick with it. Thanks very much. We'll see you tomorrow.